Jnana Kalusham Jeevam Jnana Bhyasad Vinirmalam Kritva Jnanam Svayam Nashyed Jalam Katakarenuvat Ajnana Kalusham Stained by Ignorance Jeevam The Embodied Soul The Self Conditioned by Ignorance Jnana Abhyasat, from constant practice of knowledge. Vinirmalang, pure. Kritva, having made. Jnanang, knowledge. Svayang, itself. Nashyet, disappears. Jalang, water. Katakarenuvat, as the powder of the kataka nut. Through repeated practice, knowledge purifies the embodied soul conditioned by ignorance, and then itself disappears, as the powder of the kataka nut disappears after it has cleansed muddy water. Namaste. So this verse is the first one that gets into the actual practice. How can we go from being conditioned to being liberated. This gives the steps, and it's very simple, really. With knowledge, jnana, transcendental knowledge, the wisdom of Brahman. What is Brahman? What is the self? All the things we've been talking about. Then remember Brahman, even in the course of ordinary activities. And especially when you first get up in the morning and when you go to bed at night, to meditate and fix the mind on Brahman until it becomes quiescent, still. So by repeated practice, that means every day, every day, as a regular routine and throughout the day as far as possible, to make this a habit, to make repeated impressions of the reality on the mind. And then this will qualify you, this will bring you to the point where the self can reveal itself, and you'll get it. <laughs> and that's a wonderful moment. That's the moment we're all looking forward to and working towards in our spiritual life. So, knowledge purifies the embodied soul. The Atma, conditioned by ignorance, can only be rescued by knowledge, because knowledge is the only thing that removes ignorance, just like light is the only thing that removes darkness. And in the same way, even a single ray of light removes the darkness in a darkened room. So even a single fact of transcendental knowledge, like aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, when remembered again and again and again, leads to liberation. One of the most powerful and effective practices is chanting Aum. But not just chanting Aum, like mechanically, or remaining in ignorance, but in tandem with remembering this transcendental knowledge, knowledge of Brahman. What is Brahman? What am I? What is my relationship with Brahman? How is it that I've come under the influence of ignorance, and how can I get out? Your local yoga class down at the gym or whatever, you know, they're chanting Aum, but just as a formality, without the accompaniment of knowledge. And the effect is very small. But chanting Aum together with remembrance of the knowledge about Brahman, this transcendental knowledge is very effective. Yesterday, I was downtown shopping 
running around the marketplace in a tuk-tuk, auto rickshaw. And it's chaos, you know? <laughs> There's people everywhere, shops everywhere, displaying all kinds of wares and traffic. I mean, I mean the way people drive in India and Sri Lanka is just total chaos. Westerners go crazy the first time they see it. But it's like, you know, the only rule is there's no rules, right? <laughs> so there's cars and tuk-tuks and bikes and scooters and motorcycles and cows and whatever coming from every direction at all times. It's chaos. So in the midst of all this, I was thinking, oh, and remembering Brahman, and all the chaos just faded into the background. And I felt peace. Even in the midst of the crowded marketplace. And good old Osho Rajneesh always used to say, when your peace is, remains peaceful, even in the midst of the marketplace, then you know you've got the real peace. Otherwise, your peace is just borrowed. You can go up in the Himalayas or in some uh, forest somewhere, and it's peaceful, yeah. But as soon as you come out, you forget. Why? Because the mind becomes attached to sense objects through desire. Here's a really nice quote speaking about the practice. With the help of the proper process, one should discipline the mind that remains dispersed amidst objects of desire and enjoyment, and one should bring it under control. Constantly remembering that everything in the world is full of misery, one should withdraw the mind from the enjoyment arising from desire. Remembering ever the fact that the birthless Brahman is everything, one surely does not perceive the born, that is, the host of duality. One should wake up the mind merged in deep sleep. One should bring the dispersed mind into tranquility again. One should know when the mind is tinged with desire and is in a state of latency. One should not disturb the mind established in equipoise. So these are good instructions. And basically the aim is to quiet the mind. The mind is so restless. I like to compare it to a quicksilver chariot. You know, did you ever play with mercury? And by the way, if you do, you should be wearing gloves and goggles because it's very toxic. But mercury, at the slightest agitation, it moves and jumps here and there. This is wild stuff. So the mind is like that. The mind is like a restless monkey. <laughs> it's jumping and chattering and jabbering and blabbering. You have to make this mind quiet. And really the best way I know of is mantra. Because mantra takes over the internal conversation. Remembering this and that thinking of this and that, desiring things. And it makes it focus on the unborn, the birthless Brahman. Aum. It's so nice. Aum never changes, just like the self, the unchanging. Unborn means it never comes into manifestation. It always remains separate, undisturbed, calm. So this is the peace. When we pray, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. This is the peace that we're talking about, Shanti. The peace is when the mind settles down and it's no longer disturbed by desire and suffering. Every impression of the world through the senses is suffering. Try to understand. It's a disturbance, an agitation. 
as Patanjali calls it, a chitta vritti, a modification of the mind. The natural state of the mind is peace, calm, silence. And when that silence is disturbed by ripples of sense impressions and thoughts, that ruins our peace. And without peace, how can we be happy? Sense enjoyment is not going to make us happy. We should know this. huh? By experience, every time we get even a little sense enjoyment, it leads to attachment, isn't it? And then the other thing is, it's never perfect. And even if we get the perfect sense enjoyment, it doesn't last. It fades away leaving us wanting it again. See, this is the trap. This is what keeps us from being enlightened. This constant reinforcement of desire and attachment. So the only way out of this is to discipline the mind. And by repeated practice daily and as far as possible during the day, too. Like, I'll often find myself doing something, usually around the house, you know, just chores and like that, and chanting internally, Aum Namah Shivaya, or whatever. And always Aum, though. The old Vedic mantras begin and end with Aum. If they don't, it's not a Vedic mantra. Even though some people promote these various different mantras that don't involve Aum, they are not strictly Vedic, and they do not lead to anything really desirable. The only thing that we should desire is liberation. This is called Mumukshatvam, which is basically the, the ego, the upadi of a sadhu. A sadhu means someone who's expert. If we're expert at life, if we really know what life is all about, we will desire only liberation because that is the actual purpose of this world. And when we endeavor to fulfill that purpose, we find ourselves becoming happy for no reason at all. This is self-realization. Aum Tatsa, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.